All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome from my, my home to your home. I hope you are doing well this morning. Um, I am Sujay King Liu, Dean of the College of Engineering. I want to especially welcome alumni who are joining us and as well as our current students and their families. We're really delighted that you could all be here with us today to learn from some of our faculty who have been rising to the challenge of COVID-19. While we're waiting for more people to join us, um, we thought it might be fun for everyone to share where they physically are um, this morning. Um, so in the chat window, if you don't mind, why don't you uh, write your name and then the city where you are in right now. And um, it'll be interesting just to see from you know, all parts of the world where we are at this morning. Wow. This is great. Virginia, that's probably the farthest. Um, North Carolina, fantastic. And I Philadelphia. London. London. London, uh, that's, the, that's the farthest so far? Vietnam. Vietnam, wow. What time is it? It's in the middle of the night in Vietnam. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Go pairs. Fantastic. I think, um, I think Vietnam is <laughs> probably the most impressive one in terms of the time zone difference. Oh, thank you. And welcome again to all of you. Um, so as you all know, Berkeley Engineering, we are top ranked um, in, in engineering because we're at the epicenter of innovations that are solving society's most um, challenging problems. And we know that COVID-19 is a prime example of a global problem, societal scale problem that engineers can help to solve, um, not only by helping to speed the discoveries that will lead to a new vaccine, but also to new treatments, more effective treatments. So here at Berkeley, we've really mounted a, a significant effort in research to respond to COVID-19 and, and our faculty and students are working around the clock. And so today to get a picture, to give you just a glimpse of what is happening in our college, I'm delighted to have some of my faculty colleagues joining us here today. Um, these are Pat Professor Patrick Sue, who's an assistant professor of bioengineering. Um, he's a member of the Innovative Geno Genomics Institute. Um, and th that institute is led by Jennifer Doudna, our most recent Nobel Prize, uh, Nobel laureate. And uh, Pro Professor Sue is also a Deb faculty fellow. He is working to apply new CRISPR tools that he has discovered to provide a faster and better diagnosis of COVID-19 infections. And his research also involves searching for new drug targets using CRISPR genetic screens. Next, I have um, with us here today, Professor Simo Makiharj. Harj. Um, he's an assistant professor in mechanical engineering, um, and he is collaborating with other faculty to develop uh, to adapt sleep apnea machines to provide respiratory assistance to uh, patients who are suffering from COVID-19. And we've learned recently that actually respiratory assistance is more effective because by the time patients need to go on ventilators, it's too late. About 90% of patients who are on ventilators don't make it. Um, Professor Maki Harj is also uh, studying the uh, transport of droplets uh, that carry infectious diseases. And then finally, we have Professor Cara Nelson. Um, she's a professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. She's also my Associate Dean for Equity and Inclusion. Um, professor Nelson is leading a multidisciplinary research team who are working with more than 20 wastewater agencies and six health, uh, county health departments to accurately track COVID-19, measuring the SARS-CoV-2 virus, um, the levels of that virus in wastewaters. This is um, one effective way to track the spread of infections um, and can help inform public health authorities uh, to deploy resources where they, they are needed the most. So what we'll do first here today is to have um, each of these faculty, um, we actually had them pre-record uh, pre some videos on their research. And if you have any questions while you're watching their videos, please feel free to type in your questions in the Q&A box and um, that way we'll most efficiently be able to answer your questions after the videos are shown. So we'll show you, start first by showing you the three videos uh, from these three, three professors. Hi, so I'm Patrick Sue. Um, I'm an assistant professor in bioengineering and a dev faculty fellow 
here at the College of Engineering and looking forward to telling you today about some of the work that my group has been doing um, to try to contribute to the global research response um, against the coronavirus. So we've been trying to develop new ways of trying to do rapid point of care um, tests based on the CRISPR technologies that we've been developing over the last decade. And I thought by way of introduction, I'd start by introducing three of the most common types of tests for COVID-19. The first are these rapid serology antibody tests that look a lot like at-home pregnancy tests where you prick your finger, put in a drop of blood, and look for antibodies against the virus. The second two types of tests, ELISA's and PCR tests, are lab-based tests. And the ELISA tests also look for antibodies, which tell you if you've been previously exposed to the virus, while the PCR tests tell us if you have an active infection and could potentially go ahead and spread um, COVID-19 to other people. So in the early days of the pandemic and starting in March and in April, my group in a big collaboration with other colleagues at UCSF conducted one of the first systematic studies of these rapid antibody tests, which had been flooding the market. And what we did was we took blood samples from um, uh, hundreds of patients that had been seen in San Francisco area hospitals and tested these different blood samples against these different antibody tests um, phased by different time points since symptom onset. And so what we were able to see, as you can see, for example, at one to five days, most of the tests turn up negative and over 20 days, so three weeks or more after you've been exposed to the virus and begin to have symptoms, um, most of these um, tests would be positive. However, we were also able to show, despite some of the tests being pretty good, many of the tests actually had pretty unacceptable performance. And so this was able to help contribute to better regulation of, around these serology tests, which were then required to have more rigorous validation before they could be marketed in the States. After this, we turned our attention to try to develop viral tests for active infections, which is really what I do. I'm a molecular biologist and geneticist by training. And so you can see here on the left graph, um, these are careful longitudinal nasal pharyngeal swabs or throat swabs that are taken at different patients in a German hospital um, relative to symptom onset. And so what you can see and quickly appreciate is within just a few days of feeling ill, your viral loads in your upper respiratory tract crash, right? So you can no longer find and detect virus in your throat and in your nose. And on the right hand side, you can see these are PCR tests. You can see that within just a few days, this drop in the viral load is matched by a massive drop in the positivity of your test. And after a couple of weeks or so, you can see the antibody results start to rise. And so this basically goes to show that we need to be able to test people frequently. If we wait too long after symptom onset, you might be false negative or you might be able to spread the infection to other people, but not be able to actually you know, detect it as your viral loads decrease. And so you can see here, um, this study was done in February, in late February, in a northeastern Italian town on either end of a 14-day lockdown, where they did really systematic swabbing and medical surveys of nearly basically all of the 3,000 or so people in that town. And what they were able to show based on the medical records, the symptom reports, and, and so on on the right-hand side was that 40% of these infections were asymptomatic. So 60% of people might feel ill if they're infected with SARS-CoV-2. Only 40% of them, well, um, you know, actually don't feel anything at all. And so if you model the effect of frequent viral testing in the workplace or on campus, you can see that the ability to reduce the spread of the virus completely depends on our ability to test more frequently. And this was in the case of high-risk workers, assuming this 40% asymptomatic rate, which is backed by very careful data. And so the question is, how can we test people more frequently, catch these asymptomatic individuals who may not be able to isolate and shelter in place if they don't actually know that they're sick, right? And how can we actually start to control this pandemic? One of the major issues in the Bay Area is that it can take you know, three to four or more days mm -hmm. after you get your test to get your test result back, right? And so one of the things that we wanted to do was be, be able to make a test that could give you an answer on the spot. So many of you may know about a technology called CRISPR-Cas9. 
which is an enzyme derived from bacteria that can use a guide RNA to find a matching piece of DNA target. There are other types of CRISPR enzymes from throughout the microbial evolution. And those are known as Cas12 and Cas13. And what those enzymes can do is unlike Cas9, once they find a target that is programmed by their guide RNA, they activate a general nuclease activity. And so this is very clever. What we can then do is include inside of this detection reaction a fluorescent reporter linked by a DNA or RNA oligo that will get cleaved when the CRISPR molecule gets activated. And then this will then release a fluorophore from the quencher molecule that quenches its fluorescence. And then now you get fluorescence. And this becomes a detectable label. So essentially what you can do is if you have a swab or a saliva sample, and then you put in a CRISPR molecule that's programmed to detect the SARS-CoV-2 virus, you'll then activate the CRISPR molecule, cleave this fluorescent reporter, and then get a fluorescent label that you could detect on a machine or on a device. So we thought, could we go ahead and leverage these properties to make a more rapid SARS-CoV-2 test? One way that you could do this is through a fluorescent reader on a bench top, or you could actually get this to work via chemical modifications onto a paper strip where you can read a yes, no result, much like an at-home pregnancy test. So what we wanted to do was to just think end to end about what it takes to make a real diagnostic product. We have to be able to collect the samples, whether it's a saliva sample or a nasal swab, to be able to process the sample to release its nucleic acids so that we can detect it with the CRISPR test and then actually read it out, whether it's fluorescence or a lateral flow paper strip um, output. The real question though was not just could we get this to work, but could this work with adequate sensitivity, right? And so it turns out in these upper respiratory tract samples, these nose or throat swabs, that you need to oftentimes achieve atomolar sensitivity. So in lab, we talk a lot about micromolar or even nanomolar amounts of things, but then it goes femtomolar and then atomolar. And those are, you know, that can often, you know, be actually a single molecule problem. There can be one or 10 literal copies of RNA virus, SARS-CoV-2 RNA virus in a microliter of saliva solution or nasal swab solution, right? Can we actually have a test that could be so exquisitely sensitive? So what we wanted to do was to develop a way to actually amplify those nucleic acids, which is essentially what happens currently with these PCR tests, except this requires specialized equipment and trained technicians. We wanted to do something that wouldn't need these expensive lab equipment and thermocyclers. So what we went in ahead and figured out was the biochemistry of a different type of amplification technology called LAMP, which is able to work in an isothermal fashion, meaning a single temperature. So you don't need any fancy machines, just a water bath or a heat block, or even a kitchen sous vide is sufficient to you know, achieve those temperatures. What we're able to do then is amplify the amount of SARS-CoV-2 target we want to recognize, and then put in the CRISPR-Cas13 molecule that my group has been developing over the last few years. These Cas13 enzymes are able to recognize this amplified nucleic acid, clear the reporter, and then release fluorescence. So just you know, flying through some of the data of how we did this, we took apart the LAMP reaction and inserted different RNA conversion sequences um, into the amplification reaction verify that we were able to you know, do this amplification and convert the molecules into a substrate that could be recognized by Cas13. We screened a variety of different insertion positions. And what you can see here is in yellow is the detection by Cas13 of, and which on the y-axis you can see a detectable fluorescent signal where you get really rapid signal within 10 or so minutes. And we actually have a condition that was significantly better on the bottom right, you can see within five or so minutes, we reach already maximal signal of the SARS-CoV-2 target that we're trying to recognize. And this was, by the way, 100 copies per microliter. So we're then able to achieve atomolar sensitivity. So we then you know, did a limited detection experiment, and we can detect with this current protocol down to 10 copies per microliter. So it's an extremely sensitive and specific assay. And then the question was, while we have this chemistry working at the bench top, could we really make it work end to end? 
So there are a couple of things that we're working on in order to actually have something that could be used for community surveillance. One of the things that we wanted to do was to make sure we could actually have the right guide RNAs. And so by that, we worked, collaborated closely with Liana LaRoe in the bioengineering department, one of my good colleagues, and Katie Pollard at the Gladstone Institute. So a real cross Bay Area collaboration where many of our, these researchers have been repurposing ourselves to respond to this pandemic. We're able to find guides that are specific to different strains of SARS-CoV-2 that are specific for SARS-CoV-2 and not other coronaviruses and other bugs or microbes that might be in the upper respiratory tract. We're able to optimize the timing of these amplification reactions, the enzymes that are used, um, actually use real saliva samples in order to optimize this, and then finally develop a really simple two-step protocol that gives you a diagnostic result within 30 to 35 minutes. This is able to detect actual SARS-CoV-2 virus. And after systematic optimization of the reaction, we're able to get a result um, within you know, two minutes of putting the LAMP reaction into CAS-13. So it's extremely rapid and specific. And we're now collaborating with a variety of different folks around campus in order to start to, under IRB, actually use this to uh, surveil the campus community um, using tests that avoid the current supply chain constraints of PCR testing. We've been revisiting how we do sample collection and collaborating with the asymptomatic saliva testing study um, being run here on campus by the Innovative Genomics Institute, where I'm an investigator, which is the CRISPR Institute on campus that is led by Jennifer Doudna. And what we do is we are basically doing weekly saliva testing of all the central researchers on campus, where they enter these kiosks, spit into a tube. These tubes get assembled, accessioned in the diagnostic testing lab on the first floor of the IGI building. My lab is just a floor above. And then we can then result, uh, report a, a result, whether you're positive or negative. But what we want to do is to augment this existing infrastructure by having a point of care device which is being developed by Dan Fletcher in the bioengineering department and his postdoc Sung Min San, where you can basically take mobile phones, put them onto a box and use a variety of different mirrors and optics and filters to turn this box into a point of care fluorescent reader that can use a mobile phone camera. Everything's already built in, it's cloud connected, the hardware is there, the camera is there and use that on a bench top in order to screen researchers as they enter a floor or leave for the day. And so um, with that, I'm happy to take questions. Really grateful to the wonderful members of my group. This has been a really close collaboration with David Savage and Jennifer Doudna in the MCB departments and Dan Fletcher in the BioE department as well, as well as Leanna LaRoe, Fyodor Ernov, Katie Pollard, and Melanie Ott. Thanks so much. Thank you for inviting me to give this presentation. My name is Simo Mekiharju. I am an assistant professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. My research focuses on the advancement of physical understanding of multiphase flows for applications ranging from energy conversion to naval hydrodynamics. I have had the pleasure of working with dozens of talented undergraduates and graduates. Our work spans the scales from microscopic laboratory experiments to flows around full-scale ocean-going ships. Today, I will briefly describe two projects related to the spread of SARS-CoV-2. First, I want to share two slides about the project that I participated in, but was led by my senior colleague, Professor Grace O'Connell. This project was focused on converting ordinary CPAP and BiPAP machines to assist in COVID patient treatment this project was a great example of putting to real-world use many of the concepts we teach. The Ventilator SOS team is a truly interdisciplinary team. You can find out more of this team from their website. The concepts taught in classes such as ME103 and 106 were put to real-world use to deliver air-oxygen mixtures under positive pressures to patients utilizing modified CPAP and BiPAP machines. The list on the right just briefly summarizes 
some of the concepts that we were able to put to good use. And these are the kind of concepts that uh, our students see in the classroom, and it was great to see them help this actual application. In the end, the Ventilator SOS team shipped many of these converted machines to places including New York and Florida during the early, desperate uh, weeks of the pandemic. More about this effort can be found on the team's website, ventilatorsos.org. Now, for the remainder of this presentation, let us discuss a second project related to controlling the spread of SARS-CoV-2. By now, all of us have heard some discussion about SARS-CoV-2 spreading through droplets and aerosols. To make fast progress on this topic, my colleague from civil engineering, Professor Evan Bariano and I, together with two of our students, Tivetni and Eric, teamed up to investigate droplet transport. A wider effort also involves a large team, including people from the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory and others. But I will talk about the part of the work that we are doing here at Berkeley. As we breathe, speak, or do anything, we humans are actually producing droplets over a wide spectrum of sizes. The droplets we produce range from sub-micron to those order of a millimeter. However, the droplets that are on the smaller end and the ones that we cannot easily see by eye are more numerous than the large ones. This flow of droplets with air is actually a multi-phase flow. Hence, it falls squarely within the area of interest to me and my colleague Evan. Given this, when the pandemic started, we teamed up and decided to do the most we can to contribute to the ongoing wider scientific effort. We began a systematic study of droplet transport over a wide range of parameters of relevance, spanning from scientific research experiments to generating material for public outreach. On the left, we see a repeatable respirator rig that coughed up simulated droplets. These droplets were made visible by fluorescence, with color of the droplets identifying their size. While the emitting person got covered in their own germs in this case, the release to the ambient was greatly reduced. That is, as confirmed by countless of studies by now, even a simple mask can help reduce the spread of the droplets. Now, let's look a bit more into this fascinating and definitely presently relevant flow. When we discuss human-generated droplets, the word aerosol is often brought up. Aerosols are just small droplets, but we use this special term to identify droplets that are small enough to no longer behave like ballistic projectiles but they can instead linger in the air longer and they act more like flow tracers. An aerosol, such as the one you see here on the left, would mostly follow the local flow. A droplet, on the other hand, is what we call a droplet that has large enough size that the trajectory of the droplet is dominated by its initial momentum. Now, depending on the context, a droplet smaller than about 50 microns, which is the diameter of a typical human hair, the droplet smaller than that could be considered to be already an aerosol. As humans are not very good at producing the same droplet release event every time, we had to begin our research by devising a system to generate repeatable release events of droplets. Here on the left, we see one such release event with highly exaggerated concentration of droplets that we were studying in the very beginning. We actually used a device called phase Doppler interferometer to quantify the generated droplet size distribution. A fun piece of trivia here is that the PDI was actually invented by a Cal alumni from the 70s. For this research, we could use actual droplets or solid particles as simulated droplets. We actually use both 
for the reason that when we use solid particles, we have the benefit of diameter remaining constant as it is not affected by evaporation or condensation. This simple consideration and the importance of looking at both came into uh, being by the collaborative effort with numerical modelers. The first step for such studies is often to make sure that they can uh, properly model fixed size droplets. The first step in our research was to generate a series of geometries used to study the droplet release. The geometries considered range from a realistic 3D printed model of a human airway based on a computed tomography scan all the way to a simple pipe. The reason for considering this wide spectrum of geometries was that the e simpler ones are easier to analyze. However, those are often used in studies, but they do lose some physical relevant details. We also got to do some real-world engineering when we built the droplet and particle generation and air supply system. As an interesting tidbit here, to produce the humid air that was initially free of droplets, we ended up actually making use of the historic Hans Albert Einstein flume. Hans was the son of uh, the famous Albert, and Hans was a very accomplished professor in his own right, right here at Cal. So we put these uh, resources to good use and were able to produce both the air needed for the droplet release experiments and for the um, particles. Once we had a way to produce the droplets and the co-flow of air, we needed to have a room, a room like no other on campus. We needed an environment free of thermal gradients, uncontrolled flow, and even free of electrical potentials. The additional requirement was that we had to use lasers powerful enough to burn through plastic in this room. <laughs> this might have had something to do with why it was better that we ended up using a simulated human being instead of a real volunteer to generate the droplets too. We built a room called the Cal COVID Cube which is re, uh, located actually in O'Brien Hall. With all the equipment in place, we began studying the release of droplets and particles, ranging from a release from pipe to a simplified geometry here in the middle, all the way to a more realistic geometry on the right. We also took some high-speed videos of these uh, particle release events, and as we can already see quite evidently, the pipe that is widely used in a lot of the published studies, just for its simplicity, is definitely a poor substitute for anything more human-like, yet alone a real human, as the details of the release de uh, differ significantly. Here we see the release of particles from a repeatable respirator rig when we have a human-like release uh, geometry. This kind of experiment is great for relatability and for looking at the effect of masks and barriers for informing uh, human beings and being relatable. However, this kind of uh, geometry was not that easily leveraged for numerical model validation. Hence, we also did do a lot of work with the more simplified geometries. From the L1 semi-realistic model, we were able to get a lot of quantitative information too that is suitable for model validation. However, it begins to be less relatable because the release geometry no longer looks like a human being coughing. In this case, we are looking at particle tracking velocity results for particles coming out during a cough-like event from a simplified model. While there are many details we could discuss that we have uh, already discovered, and this could be a one-hour talk, in the interest of time, I will just show you one of our key findings to date. We have already also seen, and continue to investigate this further, that relative humidity in the room can have a significant effect on how the droplets spread. This has to do with the rate of evaporation of the droplets 
and as you can imagine, a droplet that evaporates becomes smaller and behaves more and more like an aerosol and less and less like a pennant ball. In this study, we used uh, fluorescein laden droplets and we measured fluorescein concentration deposited on these sample plates down to 10 parts per trillion. And with this measurement, we were able to quantify how the released droplets were deposited around the Calcovid cube. With our research partners, our goal is to better describe how air flows influence the droplet and aerosol transportation from classrooms here at Cal to clean rooms, for instance, in manufacturing. The key thing here is that one size does not fit all, and there are a lot of uh, details to consider. However, as a final comment, I would like to say that what I want to really relay is what we study and teach here at Cal is truly connected and can have an impact in the real world. Even though I realize that to the students, this may not always seem to be the case. Together, we will make it through these challenging times stronger than ever. Please take care. Go Bears! Good morning, everyone. My name is Karen Nelson. I am a professor in civil and environmental engineering, and I am going to share with you some updates about a project we launched at the beginning of the pandemic to develop a new tool and actually operationalize that tool to reduce the transmission of COVID-19. I've been incredibly honored to work with a very talented and dedicated team of researchers, including undergraduates, graduate students, and postdoctoral researchers to, uh, to work on this project. And we have received critical funding to launch such a large project at the beginning through a number of rapid response grant opportunities that were put in place by institutes on campus, including Citrus and IGI, and also funding that we uh, brought in from a private foundation. So what is wastewater-based epidemiology? It turns out that individuals that are infected with COVID-19, the, the actual virus, which is called SARS-CoV-2, it infects not just the respiratory tract, but also the intestines. So that means that infected individuals excrete the virus in their stool. So if we collect a sample of wastewater from the pipes or the collection system that, that collects all that wastewater, either at, the, at a building or at the neighborhood scale or at the influent to a wastewater treatment plant, then we can get information about the infection status of everyone in that population that contributed to that sample. So this is a very powerful way to collect pooled samples. And this is, has a number of advantages over other types of public health information, because if you compare it to the testing of individuals, that type of case data is actually biased because not everyone gets tested. In particular, individuals that are asymptomatic may never go and get tested. And as you can see in this graphic, which shows uh, the lighter the color, the lower the tests implemented per capita, you can see that there's a big variety, a big range in the amount of testing that gets done. And so we have biased information about our communities. There's another potential advantage that wastewater testing has, which is that because individuals start excreting the virus before they would even go and get a test, that we may get an early warning if infections are starting to increase in the population. So we can potentially implement this tool at a range of scales. If you see on the left, at a very small scale, we could be collecting samples at individual dorms, on campuses, or at skilled nursing facilities. And we could use this information to get an early warning on when cases start to occur in the residents. If we get that information, so if we get a positive signal from the wastewater, then we could send in a rapid response team to test every individual and isolate those cases, do contact tracing, and prevent the spread 
within the residence. We can also collect information at the neighborhood scale and get unbiased information about the, about, about the prevalence in different communities. And then if we zoom all the way out and we collect information at the individual treatment plants and collect information for the entire region, then we can compare prevalence geospatially and we can get information on where there are hotspots so that we can contain them. We can use this information to decide if it's appropriate to relax shelter in place restrictions because we see a constant decrease in the prevalence or the concentration of SARS-CoV-2 in the wastewater. We are not the only group working on this and that's a good thing. There are teams all across the world that have been working on developing the tools uh, to be able to do this and then to actually use them. An exciting announcement came out last week that Health and Human Services is working to put in place a program to test, the, to test up to 30% of the wastewater in all of the US as part of an early warning system. So we recognized this potential early on in the pandemic and we started to draft our research agenda, but we also recognized that if we did things the typical way that we do research, which is you, you do your high quality research, you get your results, and then you work on translating that into practice, we didn't have time to do that. We might miss the entire pandemic. So since the beginning, in addition to the research that we've been conducting, we've been working on the implementation. So what I'm going to share with you are some highlights on, the th on three different areas of our research, which are um, we didn't actually have methods to detect this virus at the beginning of the pandemic. So we have developed a novel method that I'll share with you. We also started working on how you can distinguish specific viral strains, and I'll tell you about why we think that's useful in a moment. And then we've been working on how we can integrate this information from wastewater with the other types of public health information to actually inform decision making. In parallel, and in the, with a high, high, in a highly iterative fashion, we have been working on implementing um, this capability and, and how to integrate the information into actual decision making. So one of the barriers was that there are not enough laboratories that have the capacity to test wastewater samples. And so we decided that we should go ahead and build a high throughput laboratory. And then we put, have put into place all of the types of partnerships and ability to share information to launch a monitoring program for our entire region and also for our UC Berkeley campus. So digging in first to the research, we developed a novel method to detect the virus in wastewater. And one of the insights that we had, because a part of our team, we have collaborators in molecular biology, is that it might be more effective to target the RNA of the virus that is in the sample rather than the virus itself. So if you look at our cartoon Im image up here on the right, this squiggly line in the middle, that is the genetic code. That's the RNA of the virus. And SARS-CoV-2 is actually a fairly wimpy virus and it breaks open very easily in wastewater. So most of the other teams that we are aware of have been focusing on concentrating and targeting the virus itself. Well, we developed an approach to actually encourage the viruses to lyse. We call it the 4S method, which stands for sewage, salt, silica, and SARS-CoV-2. We use high salt concentrations to lyse the virus. And then we concentrate all the RNA that's been released as well as any other RNA that's in the wastewater. And then we can detect very low concentrations using quantitative RT-PCR. And this last step is actually the same approach that's used with clinical samples. We have found that our method is incredibly effective and has very high recoveries. So these two bars in red and green show the concentration in gene copies of leader that we have measured of the SARS-CoV-2 virus in, in wastewater compared to an alternate method that, that concentrates the viruses by ultra filtration. So we have been successful at, a, at developing a method that allows us to detect, uh, to recover 
a high portion of the signal, which will allow us to detect very low concentrations and have a very low detection limit, which is important as prevalence decreases in our communities. If you're curious about how these samples are actually collected, the best type of sample is called a 24-hour composite. So it's not just a grab sample, but there's an actual auto sampler that is inserted into manholes and collects an aliquot of wastewater every 15 minutes or once an hour and then combines that all. And so when, when we test a sample, it's representative of all the wastewater that has flown, flown, flowed past that location in a 24 hour period. So when you combine all this, what our overall approach looks like is we collect samples at these different scales from the building to the treatment plant. We test the samples in our laboratory for SARS-CoV-2 and we have a number of controls that we run um, for QA, QC. And then we can analyze all that data to determine things like whether the concentration is increasing or decreasing over time and to compare the concentration in different locations. I'll just give you a little insight into some of this, the results that we produce. On the y-axis is the concentration of virus, and, on, and, and then each bar represents a different location that we've sampled. So fortunately, this red bar represents a portion of the service area that collects the wastewater from the south side of the UC Berkeley campus, and you can see that the concentration is fairly low. In contrast to this blue bar, which is a sample that we collected from the wastewater of the San Quentin prison when they were in the middle of an outbreak a few months ago. So you can see we're able to distinguish the difference between an area with low prevalence and high prevalence. What we didn't expect is this purple bar, which is from another community, which I won't tell you the name of right now, but that was uh, experiencing an outbreak. Fortunately, since that time, we have measured a steady decrease in the concentration indicating that they have the outbreak under control. We can also use our data from our wastewater to look at trends over time, uh, like I already mentioned, to see if concentrations are increasing and decreasing. So on the bottom here, we show information from our wastewater, the concentration of wastewater, and on the top, this is case data uh, collected from testing individuals. And what's interesting is that there appears to have been a spike in the wastewater that was not detected in the case data, again, indicating that wastewater may provide less biased information. There was also a testing window where the results were not being reported correctly. And so it can be helpful to have another source of information from the wastewater, um, again, to sort of triangulate on what the true prevalence is. Now, we haven't added the most recent samples to this graph, but fortunately we have seen that the concentration in wastewater uh, is continuing to decrease and remain fairly low. So in this particular region, the prevalence is decreasing. Another area I mentioned that we've been working on in our research is being able to detect specific strains of the virus. And we can do that because the genome of the virus mutates over time. So even a single difference in a base pair, a single nucleotide variant, um, we can detect that in theory anyway with sequencing methods. Now, why might this information be useful? This allows us to detect if we see that if we detect the same strain in wastewater from a particular area, then that would suggest that the primary mechanism of transmission is within a community. Whereas if we detect different strains, that would suggest that new strains are being brought in by people that have traveled to that area or residents that have, have gone out and traveled and brought a new strain back with them. So that can help us understand what the most important risk factors are in terms of um, allowing transmission to happen and how we, might, um, how we might reduce that. So here's some initial results. Every row on this table here represents a unique single nucleotide variant. And these are variants that were identified, that have also been identified, or sorry, that have been identified in clinical samples from 
COVID patients in California. The green dots, these rows indicate variants of SARS-CoV-2 that have been detected in patients from elsewhere in the US. And now I'm showing you in the red dots, the single nucleotide variants that we've been able to detect in wastewater. And what's interesting is that we detect most of the variants that have been detected in clinical samples shown down here, but in the top of the graph, we're also detecting variants that are from elsewhere in the country, but have not yet shown up in clinical samples in California. So again, the wastewater appears to be a great tool for getting an early, earlier signal about which strains of SARS-CoV-2 are circulating in our communities and infecting Californians. Now I'm gonna move on and share some highlights from our implementation. So I mentioned that we decided to build a high throughput laboratory. So here's a view of our laboratory. This is before a lot of the equipment arrived, but this is a biosafety level two plus space. So it allows us to work with these highly potentially contagious samples and has all the equipment necessary to do that safely. And we have hired three full-time staff and a team of volunteers um, to process up to 200 samples a week. And we're hoping to increase that even further as we gain more experience. And then to make use of this data, we uh, this month launched a regional monitoring program called COVID Web, COVID Wastewater Epidemiology for the Bay Area. This is our website. You can check it out if you want to learn more. Launching this has required working for the last many months with a wide range of partners and stakeholders from across the whole region. So we have representatives from all six counties and their public health departments around the Bay, and we're working with more than 20 different wastewater agencies to collect and provide us with samples. And we are launching, we've, we've launched this regional program also uh, in coordination with other efforts that are going on at the regional, state, and federal level. So our goal is to be complementary um, to these other efforts that are being launched. And then finally, here on our own campus. One of the things that's been challenging in translating this tool um, to be useful for campus is that we are not a self-contained campus. We are an urban campus embedded in the city of Berkeley. So we've been working oops, with the city of Berkeley um, to identify the most promising sample locations. So this is just a, a image of the south side of campus. You can see our football memorial stadium here. These are the sewer pipes and each one of these, whole, these circles is a manhole. Those are all potential sampling sites. So we have identified priority sampling sites that collect wastewater from our dormitories, from our um, Greek and co-op residences and from apartment complexes that allow us to measure the concentration of SARS-CoV-2 in, so in, in our surrounding campus community. And we are very optimistic that this is going to be a useful tool for managing the return of more and more activity to campus as we um, as we continue to open things up more and bring more research back to campus and eventually in-person instruction and of course we want to do that in a safe way and so we are working with our campus leaders to integrate this information with the other uh, testing data that they have access to so with that i again want to acknowledge the incredible team of researchers that uh, has come together to make this project possible. And thank you for joining us and go Bears. Thank you all um, professors for sharing with us your research. Um, for the members of the audience, if you have questions, please use the Q&A um, function. And uh, while we're waiting to see your questions, I'm gonna just quickly ask the, the three professors here uh, some questions. Thank you for answering questions in the chat box while during those videos. Um, maybe going back to Patrick, um, how do you see that this, um, relatively rapid test um, is going to help our campus um, reopen. Is, is, do you think it will uh, reopen of, Well, uh, no one can really say what the future will hold, right? 
<laughs> but I think I think careful testing is definitely one of the ways that we're going to be able to do this in a really you know measured, well considered, and data driven way. Right? We have a very strong clinical workflow on campus for samples to be taken you know at the Tang Center and tested in the clinical pipeline at the testing lab. However, there are other ways that we can try to expand our testing pipeline. For example, with the point of care technologies that we're developing here. One of our hopes is to be able to, under IRB, to be able to test essential researchers on campus when they enter and exit the research building. And if we can actually field test this to test potentially real cases, right? Or at least at the very least test real people, we can start to understand what the different kinks are and to figure out how we can actually start to scale this. But I think, you know, these clinical tests and point of care tests are, you know, they sort of address different needs, one of which can be massively parallelized, right, in clinical labs, whereas others may be useful for entry exit, screening in specific enclosed places and so on. So different applications, but we need them all. That's great. Um, do you have any idea of the time frame that these tests will become available? The specific technologies that we're building? Yes. So we're, we're currently working, we have the, basically the benchtop chemistry works, right? And we have validated that on a clinical matrix of samples. And we're working now to actually develop it into uh, microfluidic chips so that they can be disposable tests that each person gets a different cartridge. And mm -hmm. that's going to be integrated into these mobile phone uh, sort of detection devices that I showed that can just fit on a bench top. And so we're working hard to move this from, you know, bench top chemistry into something that can be sort of field tested in the real world. So hopefully, hopefully soon, hopefully soon. We're trying, we're trying hard. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Patrick. Um, going back to SEMO, um, what, when do you, so it seems like we're going to need to wear masks for continue to wear protective, um, personal protective equipment for quite some time. How do you think the um, results of your research are going to translate into um, benefit for our community, actually our community worldwide? So uh, some of the collaboration we are doing with uh, LPNL in particular, we are uh, going beyond the canonical room that I showed you, the CalCovid cube. And we are also doing testing in the Flex Lab, uh, where we have a more realistic uh, room-like environment. In addition, we'll also do some droplet release in a classroom in on campus, we got permission uh, from civil actually to do it. So uh, it will hopefully help uh, show the effects of our uh, airflow in the room for the probability of the spread and uh, help people uh, both uh, be more mindful of uh, things that can cause the spread, but also perhaps be more comfortable with proper ventilation and proper filtering and masks, how things can be safer. All right, great. Thank you. Let's see. I'm going to check the questions and answers. Um, so for Kara, have you monitored the um, unit one to three wastewater the, the dorms? Great question. Yeah, we do. We have a sampling location that's downstream of the dorms. So at this point, we're not monitoring the individual dorms yet because our dorm residents are actually being tested through nasal swabs twice a week and they get those results very quickly. So we've decided that the most efficient use of wastewater sampling for the south side area of campus is a manhole that collects the wastewater from a larger swath of the community. So we're getting information not just on our individual dorms, which we're already testing, but the apartments and other residences that campus doesn't actually own and control. So that way we can get complementary information about whether we see an uptick in the concentration. So we feed that same information back to the same decision makers on campus that are making um, important decisions about whether to go in and do additional testing. So if they do see an increase, then they could encourage all the residents of the South Side um, to go and get tested, given that we, we see a potential outbreak starting. That makes good sense. Thanks very much, Cara. I want to thank all of our uh, faculty panelists again this morning for sharing their work with us. And thank you all for attending, um, the alumni and, and students and families for joining us today. We hope that you will enjoy the rest of the homecoming weekend. And as always, go Bears. <laughs>